I just wanted to take this time to thank everyone for our fourth iteration of our Summer Impact Consulting Fellowship. We're so excited to hear all of the amazing work that you, your teams have done throughout the summer. For those of you who I may not have met throughout the time, my name is Nima Farsh and I'm the director of the Center for Social Value Creation here at the Smith School. Our mission at CSVC is to educate, engage, and empower the Smith community and the world to create a better world through business. Our work is rooted in principles like the sustainable development goals you can see behind me and environmental, social, and governance metrics, showing how companies can make an impact and make a the world a better place while making profit at the same time. Over the course of the last eight weeks, we have had the fortune of having 79 student participants do over 10,000 hours of pro bono consulting. You've worked on 13 projects with 12 different clients in this course, and I genuinely want to thank all of you for your hard work. I also want to thank a lot of other people who have made this program possible, including the faculty members who have helped coach different sessions. Uh, Nicole Coomber, who's been our consultant advisor for the MBAs, as well as giving different coaching options for students, are all of our alumni consultant advisors who have given the um, all of our, who have given the weekly feedback to your projects, the growth and development that you've needed, any questions you might have, and last but definitely not least, Soda, who has worked entirely over the last eight weeks, but many weeks even before that with planning and preparation um, for this fourth iteration before our fifth one to come this fall. Uh, so a special extra thank you to Soda as well for all of her hard work this past year and a half on ICF. Um, as we get started, I wanted to introduce our three phenomenal judges that we are very lucky to have. Um, first is Mr. Rahul Shah. Rahul leads the nonprofit advisory practice at Sattva Consulting, a mission-driven management consulting implementation firm that works with funders, social organizations, and corporates to pursue the goal of vanquishing poverty in our lifetime. In his role, Rahul works with leading nonprofits and social enterprises on their strategy, operations, and change management journeys to help them realize their aspirations for impact at scale. Rahul has had a diverse experience in the development sector, working with nonprofits at the grassroots level, consulting with social organization across domains, advising institutional donors on their big bets, and managing multi-year implementation projects on the ground. Rahul has both an MBA and Master's of Finance from the Smith School of Business and has participated in five separate impact consulting fellowship programs as a student, advisor, coach, and now as a judge. Um, next up, we have Mr. Roy Thomason. Roy has worked for over 20 years in the corporate hospitality industry as a multi-unit senior leader and joined the University of Maryland five years ago as the Assistant Director of Dining Services. He has had the pleasure of teaching at the Robert H. Smith School of Business in addition to his staff duties. Roy primarily co-teaches the Global Consulting Fellows Program where students engage with global executives while working on semester-long projects for those corporations. Roy has engaged with the Center for Social Value Creation through many facets, including judging our Smith Impact Case Competition, where his guidance and feedback led to our Smith team winning its first ever Milgard Invitational Case Competition on Social Responsibility. We're excited to have another Smith Impact Case Competition this fall and hopefully taking away international gold again this upcoming spring semester. And last but not least, Ms. Darna Damija. Darna is the Senior Director at Tata Sons. Congrats on your new role, Darna, uh, in North America, and joined the Tata Group through Tata Administrative Services in 2018. TAS is an elite cross-functional leadership group, leadership program of the $110 billion Tata Group to create a talent pool that can be tapped by Tata Group companies. At Tata Sons North America, Darna's responsibilities involve working closely with group companies and creating and refining North American business strategies, executing business development projects, contributing to the group's thinking based on emerging trends in North America in identified areas of interest, and strengthening group's efforts on branding and communications in the U.S. and Canada. Darna holds a Bachelor of Science from St. Stephen's College in Delhi, India. She also completed her MBA from the Indian Institute of Management in Lucknow, India. 
In addition, Tata is a founding member of CSVC's Coalition for Better Business. Formed in early 2018, our coalition helps to refine and enhance better business learning experiences, explore and highlight relevant industry insights, and co-create student engagement engagements that foster the knowledges, skills, and attitudes necessary to advance economic, social, and environmental prosperity. Through the support of organizations like Tata, our Impact Consulting Fellowship is possible, and coalition members have also engaged in guest lectures, live cases, skill workshops, special events, community convenings, and more. So we'd like to thank the Tata group as well for their support throughout. Um, as we get started, I'm going to pass it over to Soda, who's going to go over some of the structure for this evening's event. Hey guys, just a little intro. Um, super excited to see all your presentations. So first, as you all know, um, each presentation should be about five to six minutes in length at the five minute mark. Um, you'll get a warning in the chat that just says one minute warning. So be on the lookout for that. And at six minutes, I will unmute and verbally um, instruct you to finish up your thoughts. Um, following the presentations, well, following the five to six minute presentations, judges will have about two to three minutes um, to just ask you any questions that they may have. At the end of all 12 presentations, the judges will enter into a breakout room where they'll spend 15 minutes um, debriefing once all of the 12 teams have presented. And then finally, we'll wrap up by announcing our uh, first place winner of the $100 per team member prize and the run ups of the ICF certificates. So without further ado, um, let's get started. Perfect. As we get started, if you'd like to, me to switch slides, either just say next slide or pause and we'll click on to the next slide. So first up, we have our first Elemental Impact Solutions team focused on big versus boutique. You can begin when you're ready. Hi everyone, my name is Dylan. I'm a junior finance and economics major. Hi, my name is Manu and I'm a junior in an information science major. And we work with Elemental Impact Solutions on the Big Risk Boutique project. Next slide. So first I want to give some quick introduction to our client. Um, our client was Mrs. Mel Litter and she has 35 years of experience in financial planning, real estate, nonprofit operations and local government. Her company, Elemental Impact Solutions is a boutique consulting firm focused on helping the local communities through four major pillars, and that's housing, education, jobs, and wellness. And I'm gonna pass it to Manu to talk about our project scope. For our project scope, we first had to define the difference between big versus boutique consulting firms. And then we analyzed RFPs um, to develop, develop a RFP scoring guideline that can be used by EIS and other consulting companies in the Maryland municipalities. Next slide. So for, I'm going to quickly define RFP for those of you who don't know. Um, RFP or request for proposal is a business document that announces the project, describes it, and takes bids from contractors to complete it. Now, our, pro our project focused on government contracting, so that's an area that often uses RFPs. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to take you guys through our project journey a little bit. So first, for problem analysis, we focus on understanding the client's problem through their, and scope of work through their initial ICF document. And then we used client communication through Zoom and email to clarify the scope, as well as the final deliverable expectations. Next, we conducted background research uh, on RFPs and scheduled interviews with key players in Maryland public sector, which I'll get to in a, in a later slide. After that, we did quantitative research to go alongside our qualitative background and interviews uh, to arrive at a conclusion regarding the RFP changes. And finally, we created deliverable in terms of a updated RFP. Next slide, please. So now I want to take you guys through um, our main takeaways from our government interviews. So first we talked to Mr. John King, who is Bowie's economic development director and has been for 20 years. And he said that the determinants of the RFP decision were mainly the price of the contract, the relevant team experience, and team size. And he went on to say that specific RP criteria is reflected in the government's proposal. So in other words, categories chosen for the RFP rubric shows the specific priorities of that project. Next, we talked to Mr. Richard Griffin, who is Frederick's Director of Economic Development. And he said that RFPs are crafted based on the type of issuing organization. So for example, government contracting the important factors were uh, to be on time and on budget. So they're more willing to play it safe and 
take the contracts to the larger companies uh, for reliability and to make sure that the citizens and elected officials are satisfied. On the other hand, private companies uh, may prefer boutique firms due to their creativity, innovation, and cost. Again, this depends on the type of project and the client's risk tolerance. Next, I want to transition to Amanu, who's going to talk to you about the quantitative research and our deliverable. So before we actually uh, formulate our scoring guidelines, we thought it'd be important to conduct some quantitative research and we split into three different categories. Um, our first category is company size versus revenue growth. So we found that small consulting companies versus, versus mid-market versus enterprise, they all have very similar um, revenue growth that they bring to their companies that they're working for. Um, small consult, consulting companies will have 34%, mid-market 37%, and enterprise will have 32%. What is not mentioned here is that um, these consulting companies will yield the highest revenue growth when they're uh, working for companies that are very uh, similar in company size to them. So we thought an attribute we could add to our scoring guidelines would be um, company size compatibility. Our second category is RFP process flaws. And what we found was higher writing times will oftentimes yield higher uh, win rates. And that is because RFP response rates, are, response rates are directly proportional to company size. And that's because larger companies will have larger teams. They'll be working on um, the RFP responses and making sure all details are met and um, that the RFP responses um, go in depth as well versus smaller consulting companies they will oftentimes respond to their rfps in less than five hours so even if they have a great idea um they oftentimes will not go in depth in certain areas or miss minor minor and major details um hence they oftentimes will be um, disqualified and our third category is vendor choosing efficiency and we found that 67 of buyer's time is spent on internal dis discussion and research of the consulting company. So to kind of streamline this process, we thought it'd be helpful to, um, for the consulting companies to add a section of company background info uh, and, any, and answer any specified questions that the business had about um, the consulting companies. And we would add that as an attribute on the um, RFP scoring guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, next for our deliverable. Um, so this is this is basically an editable um, and um, certain things were taking out, taken out and certain things were added. And basically certain attributes we already talked about was team size, company size and company background info that we kind of formulated based on the research and the interview takeaways. Um, certain things we couldn't talk about today was um, we're adding clarity, interview, and references. Uh, just to note, this is kind of a very general RFP guideline, um, RFP scoring guidelines, and it's not personalized to different types of companies and where their guidelines would be different and personalized to them. So in the future, we would like to actually make personalized um, RFP scoring guidelines that kind of are, are fit to each um, different company's kind of needs and requirements. Next slide. Uh, thank you, and let us, let us know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Amanu, Dylan, and the EI team. Um, the judges, I'll let you open with any questions you have on the project, the process they went through, or other things you might have for the last few slides you've heard about. Uh, one quick question. Um, so, you know, uh, having a consultant as your client can always be tough. Uh, but what did you learn uh, more about like the uh, consulting industry um, based on, you know, um, having this uh, client consultant as your client? Sure, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to take this, yeah. Um, so yeah, I worked with Mel last semester through the Impact Consulting Fellowship as well. And I learned a lot about um, kind, of, uh, kind of communicating with the client to figure out our scope because even with and I know my, a fellow team lead, Ryan Clear, knows this a lot that even though we uh, uh, communicate with her a lot, it was still a little bit unclear the path that we went, went down. Uh, that being said, I think it's really, it's really important to learn to, even without a clear direction, to figure out something to do and have a clear deliverable by the deadline. So I think uh, kind of in spite of a lack of clarity in our project, I think it's important to work together as a team to figure out what we should do. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Can you tell me a little bit about your personal growth? Each of you, just what'd you go through? What'd you learn? What'd you experience on a different level? Yeah, so um, for me, it was really interesting because this is the first time I've ever done a, a consulting project with a real life client. 
And what I found really, um, what I kind of took away and I think was really development for me was actually having the personal meetings with Richard Griffin and John King and actually kind of learning from them and actually kind of taking lead and having kind of the independence to um, ask questions and to kind of learn more from our perspective and actually them being kind of earnest and eager to know our perspective as well, which is really cool. Cause I think, I think that gave me confidence in kind of what I could bring into the table as well. Uh, you also mentioned that 77%, uh, I think, uh, number of people felt that the RFP process wasn't the most ideal uh, way to uh, kind of communicate uh, what the vendor could offer. Uh, did you think about any other ways uh, as part of this whole learning process where you thought uh, how the process could be made more ideal apart from the formatting and uh, some of the other additions that you've suggested on the format? Yeah, so basically I thought, right, especially from our interviews and the research we did, we realized that oftentimes kind of when choosing a vendor, it's not only about the statistics, but there's oftentimes like kind of this kind of soft skills and, and kind of um, that, that is kind of required kind of choosing the vendor. So kind of having more emphasis on interviews and kind of references and actually kind of having more one-to-one -one interaction between the vendor and um, the company. I feel like that, that could be an addition that could be helpful um, for a company before they actually choose a vendor versus just kind of what's on paper. Having the one-to-one -one interaction could be beneficial as well. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, team. Up next, we have our Spark by Gabby team. Feel free to take it away. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Today, we'll be sharing our consulting work for a startup called Spark by Gabby. Uh, next slide. My name is Michael Schwartz, and I am a rising sophomore in the Smith Undergraduate School. Today, I will be presenting and reflecting on our project experience alongside my incredible team, Jaja, Jad, Tara, Ashley, and Ferris. Next slide. So first, a little bit about Spark. Spark was initially founded in March of 2020 by an individual entrepreneur, Gabby Lubin. Spark offers a platform combining studio fitness and mindfulness in live and on-demand formats, as well as professional development focusing on self-care for K-12 educators. Spark's creed is, if, is that if teaching is a community profession, teacher wellness is a community solution. As educators face historical challenges, Spark was founded amidst the start of the pandemic and is forging ahead with a new solution to meet the moment. In order to support a large group of educators, Spark is looking to expand in the business to business or B2B domain by connecting with corporate sponsors and partnering schools to develop a financially sustainable community oriented program. In working with Spark, our group's overall objective our group's overall project goal was to provide research-based insights and determine the most effective strategies to help Spark scale up. My next slide. For us, getting started on our project involved overcoming several logistical hurdles. Within the first two weeks, we encountered multiple personnel changes. One team member dropped out while a second who had initially dropped out decided to rejoin our group. Despite this initial obstacle, we were able to adjust and in the end, we were still able to engage in a full consulting cycle, of managing the project scope and calibrate based on new tasks from the client. Because Spark is an early phase startup, our project objectives ranged according to the various different tasks to complete, such as competitive marketing research, product design, app development, recruitment, and fund securement. Completing these tasks involved constant communication among the team members and the client, so we scheduled multiple weekly meetings as a team and with clients over Zoom throughout the duration of the fellowship. Despite the fellowship ending today, our journey is far from over. Our team hopes to continue our efforts to contribute to Spark's vision as our client has extended internship offers and offline networking opportunities to us, which will be directly modeled after our contributions this summer. Uh, next slide. So our recommendations for consulting. Given the early phase that Spark is at, there were a variety of categor sorry, categorical areas that required systemic improvements, including product service design, marketing and instructor recruitment, funding and sponsorship, and web and app development. To simultaneously, simultaneously advance on each of those fronts, we chose the approach of allocating consultants to individual task areas, culminating in weekly team meetings where we discussed overall strategies, assessments, and challenges as a group. So first, products and services. With regards to products and services, our team primarily focused on receiving feedback from our clientele. To gather data about teachers' pain points, such as insufficient time for self-care, we recommended Spark reach out to teachers um, through representative institutions like Teach for America. 
Based on the field and online research results, for product and service improvement, we recommended that Spark optimize current class offering by reducing class times to 30 to 45 minutes and implementing a tiered class architecture. As more instructors are onboarding from various locations across the country, we advise that Spark keep pace by providing a customized package for each instructor to fit individual needs, incentivize them, and brand Spark in a virtual environment. Next, for marketing and instructor recruitment, we recognize the need to rapidly expand Spark's presence, so we developed a three-step strategy to leverage the power of social media as a marketing tool. We identified several social media accounts that have a teacher following, and by following, interacting, and connect commenting on these accounts posts, we determined that we could successfully increase the brand visibility and awareness of the studio. This therefore would organically increase client numbers. Further, we developed scripts to cold contact social media accounts followed by our target audience to request their help promoting us and instructing new, recruiting new instructors. Our next set of recommendations focused on the funding aspect of Spark. In order to obtain funding for Spark, we recommended that Spark, one, subscribe to an aggregated grants website and set alerts for recurring grants, and two, move into crowdfunding after family and friend round if funding is still needed. As the business to business domain has the most potential to generate a large cash flow and expand the customer base, we recommended that Spark prioritize sponsorship outreach while simultaneously reaching out to schools for partnerships. For sponsor outreach, we created two pipelines and roadmaps based on locality and giving profiles. Furthermore, we focused on helping Spark develop a brand new website and app. For app development and integration with the website, a major task was to determine key features to be included in interface goals. Based on extensive client communication, we curated an app plan that Spark will now outsource to a developer. For website development, we sought to incorporate a customer-centric approach and advised building out a space for users to share their thoughts and experiences. All right, next slide. Among the recommendations we provided to Spark, some have already been adopted, implemented, and are making an impact. In securing funding, Spark has applied two grants we identified, unlocking opportunities for up to $20,000. Spark is also in the process of working with an independent app developer, incorporating and building from features we recommended. Further, Spark CEO has shared with us that she is actively looking to hire a social media manager whose responsibilities would include implementing the three-step strategy we recommended to get new clients and instructors. Building on the data we collected, Gabby will continue to diversify and enhance the class offerings to meet greater needs for educators. Uh, next slide, or actually, oh, sorry, it's on that side. Uh, reflecting back, we also wanna share a few key personal takeaways of our teammates from the project experience. Most of our team members entered the program with zero consulting experience and sought to use this fellowship as an opportunity to gain direct exposure to the field in a real world positive impact setting. By working with Gabby, who was a former educator and aspirational entrepreneur, we have gained authentic consulting experience and learned different challenges and opportunities of growing a startup. Next, through regular client communication, we learned that timing, tone, mode of communication, and vision alignment are critical for deliverables. Managing and working with a diverse team of strangers in a short period of time takes much effort and requires constant engagement. But in this short time, we have experienced and grown to appreciate the complexities facing a community-minded startup that is working to make a positive impact in education. Uh, next slide. Uh, so thank you guys, and are there any questions? Thanks, Michael and the Spark by Gabby team. I'll pass it over to the judges for questions. Uh, one one quick question. Uh, how did you like um, uh, like how did you segment the market of uh, of schools and, and educators and so forth? Were there any sort of segments or archetypes that emerged? Uh, thanks, Rahul, for the question. I can take this one. So, to uh, so for the for the customer base, mostly we're targeting K twelve educators, and for the markets, we are looking at the Boston, Washington D.C., and Chicago, the three main markets. So, to segment the market in the education industry, uh, we are mainly looking at the charter schools and to the public schools that identified as. Uh, um, the five five hundred one the with the tax exempt. Yeah, I think uh, that's how we look at it. Uh, another question for uh, for you guys. Uh, a lot of work I think has went into uh, the whole process. But according to you, what did you think while learning about the company was the USP of the company which would help it scale up? And accordingly, what do you think would be one of the bigger challenges that a company of this nature would face as it decides to scale up? 
uh, to just uh, you irritate uh, reiterated the question. So you're asking the biggest challenges that we identified that uh, Spark is facing? Right. So in your experience of getting to know uh, the founder, getting to know what the company is about, what did you think was the biggest uh, USB? Uh, what was it that set this company apart from some of the others in the market that you saw? And what do you think would be the biggest challenge in front of the company as it scales up? So first of all, since Spark is targeting the K-12 educators, so that is a, a very big dish differentiator while we are doing the uh, competitive uh, analysis. We also acknowledge that uh, this is a very niche market and uh, the, also the startup is funded by a formal educator and uh, Gabby and their, her leadership team has a very good uh, fitness and a wellness program in place. I think that will be uh, their biggest uh, uh, selling point. And the biggest challenge, as we mentioned, the Spark is at a point where they want to scale up and expand into the B2B domain. Uh, one thing uh, I want to highlight is that uh, Spark has a very good program that's financially sustainable, and they want to work with corporate sponsors uh, to sponsor uh, as many partnering, partnering schools as possible to, uh, to make it possible for as many educators to participate in the program. I think that is uh, uh, very communicate community uh, oriented and a very impactful thing to do. But uh, to do code outreach to the corporate sponsors for them to sponsor these partner, partnering schools is, uh, I think it's a big challenge as Spark is a, a for-profit organization. And that forced out of a lot of the corporate giving pro programs. So when um, Spark uh, outreach is to the different corporate sponsors, uh, they will uh, have to implement, try out the, uh, the uh, strategies for them to be willing to sponsor those schools through Spark. But all these schools are the um, like a nonprofit uh, organization. So, but that is new. I think that falls out uh, they are forced out of their parameters. So as a new thing, and I think that takes more effort uh, to, to work through the past with them. Um, so also the, the question. Yeah. Okay. also to add on to that, so, um, so Jaja did say that um, like the market, it targets like a very niche market. Um, Spark's actual like program for consumers is also very personalized, um, which like definitely stands out for some of the competitors, competitors that we've seen as well, like the combination of both physical workouts and also mental, you know, training and wellness um, is definitely catered more towards like a, a consumer than other companies that I've seen and um, allows them to maybe get like a better experience, experience for um, the price they pay. Um, also another challenge with Spark right now at the moment, um, Spark is entirely virtual. There's no like headquarters, there's no anything that's all done kind of through that online experience. And so for the pandemic and like over the last year and a half, that's been okay. But if things, if the pandemic kind of goes away over time and um, Mark, like Spark wants to expand, they need to start having kind of in-person events, maybe like an official building or office. Um, so they need to expand in that way. Are there any recommendations or findings that you gave um, the team at Spark that uh, they were not so friendly to? Uh, apologize, may you repeat the question? Were there any recommendations that you gave to the client that they were not in favor of or they rejected? Anything out of the box, like maybe seeking government funding instead of going to the school or going to B2B? Um, I can only uh, speak from my part of the work. I was responsible mostly for the sponsor strategy and the funding opportunities. Uh, most of the recommendations are appreciated and accepted by the client and they, they are in the process of implementation. Um, but I will open this question up to other teammates if they uh, have anything to make to, to make up the question. Okay, thank you. I mean, I can, I can, I can comment quickly in terms of, I mean, I don't know how specific of an um, idea I can come up with. I mean, I did. Um, so part of my work was I helped with the website and um, app development. Um, so I was kind of supposed to give recommendations um, and like look into like research and competitors and also 
like what we could like use, you know, there, there were basically three different ways we can kind of approach making an app. Like you hire an independent developer or you like kind of make your own app with like professional assistance or you just entirely make your own app. Um, in terms of money, I was kind of worried with, with price um, as you know, it can sometimes be expensive to hire an independent, independent developer versus do it yourself, even if it comes out as a higher quality. You know, for that first go around, I thought it might be smart to do something kind of, you might start small a little bit too. Uh, but with like, I'm with my help, Gabby did end up, even with my help, Gabby did end up deciding to go with like a more expensive um, independent developer, um, which something we kind of worked on there. But that was an initial idea. I had an initial approach that I took that she felt it was smarter to go a different way. Uh, yeah, to just the last point uh, on that, uh, we, we have been working very closely with the client, uh, uh, Gabby, and uh, we were making sure that we are delivering what exactly she's looking for. So there isn't, there isn't really any rejection that I can remember, but there are some small adjustments for the scope of the project, uh, how she would want us to deliver it. Yeah. You just Sometimes when you have a client, they don't know what they want or they want something that's outlandish and not deliverable. And so that's where I was trying to go with that question. See if you're in town or any of those realities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, team. Up next, we have our Lighthouse DC team. Take it away. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gita Pebrada, and I will be sharing our journey uh, with our client Lighthouse DC today. Next slide. So during the past eight to nine weeks, I had the pleasure of working with extremely talented grads and undergrads on this project. Stephanie did the market analysis, Matt performed strategy analysis, Colin did the competitive analysis, and Christian was the financial expert on this project. Next slide. So our client Lighthouse DC is the only nonprofit in the DC metro area offering moving and furnishing services to homeless who are moving into the, their new homes. A Lighthouse DC believes that an empty house is more like a shelter rather than a home. And a quick fun fact, actually, Jing Wen, who is also present here today, co-founded this um, company, Lighthouse DC, along with Brian four years ago when he was at UMD. And currently, Lighthouse DC has an amazing team of seven members who are helping the homeless in the DC area. After successfully operating the nonprofit business for four years, Lighthouse DC has decided to start a for-profit branch to support the nonprofit branch financially and also to expand the donor base. This would potentially involve two businesses moving as well as junk removal. Next slide. So our goal was to deliver a slide deck for the for-profit business case that the client could share both with the internal team at Lighthouse DC, as well as with the potential investors. We started with the question, how profitable are the junk removal and moving industries? We met with our client every week. And during the first couple of weeks, we aligned on the objectives and set the expectations. We did extensive research such as market analysis, competitor analysis, estimates for costs and revenue during the weeks three to five. This uh, involved calling the insurance companies, getting moving codes, calling the waste station in DC and et cetera. This was followed by an income statement with details on the ROI, break-even analysis, sensitivity analysis in the weeks six and seven. And finally, we presented our business case, case slide deck along with the details of the income statement to the CEO, co-founder and the board director of Lighthouse DC last week. And after their final and very valuable inputs, we provided the final slide deck, uh, uh, final business case slide deck to the client earlier today. So with this, I will pass pause on to Colin for the rest of the slides here. Overall, our client was extremely helpful throughout the past few months. They were descriptive with feedback, critical yet friendly and enjoyable to cooperate with. Despite the positive relationship, there were still a few notable challenges. Firstly, there was difficulty arranging meetings that fit everyone's unique schedule. This issue seemed largely, largely reflective upon international and nationwide business as employees have to adjust for client time zones. Building on the general concept of time, our client requested that we extend our services past the initially agreed time frame. Ultimately, this falls on us as consultants due to a failure to establish clear boundaries early in our consulting tenure. Our most formidable challenge by far was crafting a financial projection independently. The client with good faith expected us to provide a holistic income statement that accurately reflected startup cost and potential revenue. After providing our first draft, they doubted some of our figures, which led to a fair amount of much needed alteration in our projective income statement and sensitivity analysis. 
After our midpoint reflection, we realized our team figures didn't pass the common sense test, which prompted additional research and reconsideration. For example, when calculating our insurance figures, we took the base value of corporate insurance without factoring in the risk associated with moving and junk removal and the potential harm to goods or employees. After our meeting with Lighthouse, we received clarification on expected insurance figures and corrected accordingly. Similar alter alterations allowed our team to familiarize ourselves with the industry and build confidence in our work, as each piece of feedback allowed us to work towards a final product. These challenges were reflective of a professional consulting job, which was helpful in teaching us to manage time efficiently, establish boundaries, and get a little creative when necessary. Next slide, please. Simply put, the lessons learned throughout the summer were invaluable. Professional experience is a necessary supplement to academic rigor, and we encountered problems completely independent of the classroom. Specifically, our team became comfortable working in ambiguity. We quickly discovered that team members are not always assigned an area of expertise, and it's super important to adapt and learn quickly. Our unique array of professional strength allowed us to bounce ideas, offer new insight, and promote personal skill development. The aforementioned lessons will allow us as potential future consultants to take ownership and responsibility within the roles of our project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lighthouse team. Colin and Gita, it was a great presentation. I'll pass it over to the judges. Uh, one question. Uh, so what were some of like the key financial metrics highlighted in the analysis? Like what were some of those uh, important factors to the audience uh, that you were preparing the deck for internally, externally? Uh, I can cover that. Um, so the most important uh, aspect for us was startup costs. Obviously, when you're starting a moving business, there's a lot of upfront costs that they would need to cover before your revenue is even considered. Um, our main categories besides that was revenue, employee wage fees, contractor fees, fuel, insurance, and general um, SG&A uh, categories. Um, so we compiled a holistic income statement that kind of gave them a general profit um, for a year, two years, three years, and four years. I'm curious, I've got two questions. Who pays for their services? And you talked a little bit about some of the lessons learned, but talk, tell me a little bit about the personal growth that each of you experienced. I can start with that. So for me personally, I, I had a huge growth in terms of my knowledge in terms in, in the finance field. My background is biotech. So I learned a lot about how to calculate this ROI things, how to do sensitivity analysis. And the diverse background of the team was really, really, really efficient in making this project a success. And I will let other team members share their growth. Um, so I'm a little bit more familiar with consulting projects. Um, so this was a little bit under my belt, but the one thing that I really learned was, I guess, I think leadership ability. Uh, Gita really managed our time efficiently, um, set up meetings well, and assigned roles um, so we could focus on the work and not organization. I think that allowed us to excel as a team. Uh, but you asked a question about um, who was paying for the work. Could you repeat that, please? Who's paying for the services of moving these folks in their homes? So... It's, it's founded on um, donations, essentially, and governmental funding. So the goal of this was to expand to for-profit. And I guess as a second-hand aspect, they would fund the nonprofit so they could ease off governmental funding and use donations for a more positive cause. How many people do they move annually? Total, I think it was around 150. Um, they're still getting started as a company, so relatively small. Thank you. Um, Gita, you mentioned that uh, the team was of very diverse background. Uh, how did you manage conflict within the team as part of the diversity, which was a pro in most cases, but I'm sure there were conflict of uh, opinions and interest uh, at points in time. How would you go about managing something like that as a team? Yeah, definitely. Actually, to be honest, 
there were no real conflicts except the timing for our meetings. So I work full time. So I, being a team leader, leader, I decided to lead with uh, with uh, example. So I made concession on my schedule and schedule the meetings when, like, for example, these grads and undergrads they have like work during the evening, and I work from home, thankfully. So I was open to scheduling the calls during my work day. You know, when I'm in the middle of the meeting, so that everyone can really be together and work on this project and same goes with for the meetings with our client we were open to do meetings during the work hours of nine to five versus being in the evening or weekends but yeah the entire team was really supportive so and i didn't have to being around the analysis of the strategy so to say uh and when it would come to financials analyzing financials from different data sources uh did that lead to differences of opinions and uh how would you be managing something like that uh, they, yeah, there were, so uh, for financials, mostly the team sometimes had questions on what we want to actually calculate, uh, like on the, for example, the latest was the how much run-up costs do we need based on the client's request, and I clarified that those questions to the team, so they were, they, there was always a back and forth, and the team agreed most, most of the time on what we were doing together. Great, thank you, thanks so much. Okay. Thanks so much, Lighthouse DC team. Up next, we have Black Girl Ventures. Hello, everyone. Here is Black Girl Ventures presentation. Uh, next page, please. Here is our team. Um, we have uh, six members here, um, and we collaborate uh, actually from different time zones. OK, next page, please. Uh, Black Girl Ventures um, is a um, nonprofit organization. Now I will introduce it to you. Uh, first, it will help uh, Black women from three areas, access to capital, access to networks, and uh, help the small size firm to hire employees. Um, BGV has several wonderful programs to help um, women from several ways, but the most important one is BGV Pitch. Uh, it is uh, the most uh, important to help women to get capital um, um, from the founders. Uh, and um, now I would like to introduce the contribution BGV has done by far. Uh, by now, BGV has nearly held uh, nearly 200 pitches and um, it has invested a great amount in black and brown entrepreneurs. Uh, even during pandemic, the overall situation of economy is not positive. BGV has helped, helped the, the business to maintain over 200 48 jobs. Um, by com communicating with our clients, um, we are expected to write a story uh, in a white paper to tell about BGV's impact to about the community, their contribution to the community. Now, uh, let's uh, invite Amy to introduce what we have done during this project. Next page, please. So for the project uh, process, we first, um, of course, received the project and had our first client meeting uh, to get to know the client and uh, leading to us to clarify uh, our project, our goals for the project and understand what, excuse me, what they wish for us to, um, um, what they wish for us um, to uh, achieve with this project and what they want the end result to look like. So um, BGV and our team first did the external research. Of course, we did the external research. BGV suggested that we do the external research first. And then later on, we um, obtained BGV's internal data and we gathered information from both um, data, synthesizing them to create an accurate picture of the impact that BGB had on uh, the community and uh, black and brown women founders. 
And finally, we created uh, the final deliverable after meeting uh, with our team several times to edit and to really um, refine the white paper draft. Uh, next slide, please. Excuse me. So for um, the, uh, the, excuse me, the potential future directions, um, this is based off of BGV's goals for the future. Uh, we decided that for recommendations, um, uh, it would be best to, um, for their, based on their future goals, it would be best uh, that they uh, would market themselves and um, really spread their brand and name to other black and brown women founders. So the three that we recommend are host more pitch competitions and events, uh, market BGV through social media and BGV and through BGV alumni, and more collaborations with brands for sponsorships. Um, next slide, please. And that is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Cool, awesome project and uh, awesome organization. Uh, uh, what were some of the major impact metrics that you felt were critical to showcase uh, Black Girl Ventures work? Um, I could answer this question. So um, I feel like um, BGV's impact, I think their main impact would be the pitch competitions uh, because uh, the pitch competition is very unique. And um, from our research, uh, external research, uh, we also realized that um, a lot of black and brown women founders, they don't receive um, a lot of capital. And the pitch competition, um, the uniqueness of it is that it's, it doesn't have like judges, rather everybody that participate are judges and they vote on how, um, and they vote on uh, the business or the um, enterprise that they like through money. So that would raise money for the um, person that is pitching for their business. And I think that is a really impactful uh, way, not only to help uh, black and brown women founders who are struggling with, achieve, with um, access to uh, cash capital, but also it is a way for them to build community and also a way for um, uh, black and brown women founders to network with each other and to obtain business knowledge from each, from each other. Cool, great. Can you tell us about your personal growth experiences through this project? Um, I could also take that one. So for um, our group personally, um, during the first couple of, of, well, yes, the first couple of weeks, we weren't able to really receive any um, internal data from BGV. And um, we actually wasn't, we weren't able to receive it until two weeks prior to this date. So um, we really had to work together to understand, okay, what do we, what should we do now that we don't have anything um, uh, like any internal data from BGV. So we really um, came together and just brainstormed a lot on what we should do. Um, and it really, for me, it really helped me um, to think out of the box during these situations and to really conform and just um, try to find different ways to be active despite the, uh, the lack of information that we have. And I can open it up to uh, my other members to see if they also want to talk about their progress or um, yes, their progress in this uh, um, project. Um, hi, this is Lynn. I'm also on the BGV team. I just wanted to add on to what Amy said. Um, definitely, I think all of us were able to practice our out-of-the-box thinking because we literally had no other option except to do so to move forward. Um, and I think that helped to um, develop our skills to be able to think of like other potential solutions that you can take when the original planned solution doesn't work out. Um, I would also add that um, none of us really have any consulting background, so we just kind of worked our way through everything. We just kind of take every, took everything step by step and just kind of feel around to see what we can do to really make the best of the situation. Thank you. Thank you uh, for sharing the project details. Uh, a question for the team. 
uh, from what I'm understanding as part of your project, storytelling was the main deliverable uh, that you guys were supposed to deliver on. Uh, as part of that, did you end up working on the content strategy and uh, the channel strategy for the company? Uh, actually, uh, PGV um, works well uh, now. Uh, we are just expected to tell their stories uh, to their like VC founder, um, to their client, uh, sorry, to their alumni to attract more alumni or um, partner to join in this kind of uh, to join this uh, project or to uh, and contribute more to the community. So uh, actually BGV has not met um, serious uh, problems or dilemma, dilemmas uh, in, uh, for them, but they just need us to tell them uh, stories to others. So based on your research, what did you think were the strong content uh, pegs that you came across as part of your research project? Uh, when we are done, our, uh, when we are do our uh, uh, research, we discovered that uh, black and brown women uh, has limited access to enough capital, especially VC capital, uh, and uh, limited um, Net effective networking um, to achieve or run their business in a long time. And BGV is a um, um, K-Row that can connect, connect the supply and the demand together. Uh, and uh, I think uh, BGV has helped to promote uh, the development of black women on the business. So um, I think uh, BGV impressed me the most is that uh, although black and brown women um, may have difficulties running their uh, own business, especially during pandemic, uh, as for the active business, especially for the small size firm, uh, black women's firm um, suffered great loss. But during this time, BGV stand out and uh, help them. I think this, this is a key point that impressed me the most. Yeah. yeah to add on to what Wenjing said, I think like something that BGV did pretty well was um, giving us their data about like how many businesses and jobs they helped like sustain, especially during the pandemic. And that was pretty helpful in our writing of the white paper. Thanks, BGV team. Up next, we have our second Elemental Impact Solutions team focused on headsets versus cars. I'll let you take it away, team. Awesome, thank you very much. You're gonna be wondering, what does this title mean? Um, that's a very good question. We were wondering the same thing too when we started. So the whole idea behind our project is in this new environment that we're looking in, in terms of with COVID and just the kind of new technological advances that we're dealing with, what is the world gonna look like, especially in virtual reality? And this kind of hypothesis that our client had was that eventually the number of headsets that people have in terms of virtual reality is gonna outnumber the number of cars that we have on the road. And so we wanted to look at not only what problems are there currently in the state, you know, the case study of Maryland, and how can virtual reality solve these? How can we use the technology that's available to us to solve some of the state's biggest issues? and find some of the biggest gaps that our client can take forward. As Dylan you know, beautifully mentioned in that first project, our client looks for different kinds of areas where she can take her kind of expertise and put it into it. She's a single, single woman in a single company that just does fantastic things and we're looking at different areas. So we'll go, next slide. So just at a big macro sense, what is virtual reality? And that's, what, that's one of our first biggest questions, understanding the different kinds of onsets, the nuances behind what this technology is. So the breaks into three main kind of buckets, First, VR, that's what you see with the Oculus. You put it on, you're taking yourself into a new environment. The second one is augmented reality. That's kind of Pokemon Go. You're looking at the reality within itself and you're putting a different object into it. And the final is this idea of extended reality. And this is the biggest field 
and the one we really kind of took on in terms of understanding how we can use a combination of the world around us, but also combining some of the most different aspects of a different simulation. Going forward, next slide, Neil. So what are the needs? That was our biggest kind of first question on our first half of the project. What are some of the biggest issues in the state of Maryland? So the first, as you can see at the bottom, is the hybrid environment. We've all been working from home. We're doing this presentation by our computers. And a lot of that's not going to change. You know, 78% of employees want to stay in a working environment. And that's going to continue going forward. As you know, a lot of companies are adapting into maybe a two to three day office environment. Some companies are fully, fully, fully virtual for the rest of time. Twitter, Salesforce, you name it. So then we look at that and from an advantage of how can we implement this in terms of the tech, uh, you know, the, the ideas of how we work. And then on a kind of second approach, there's a giant kind of job gap, especially in medium trained workers. Um, healthcare and IT were the two biggest industries that needed these things filled. By 2021, these are the positions that are, you know, that are open and that's only growing. So with, we want to look at how virtual reality can help the common folk in terms of as we work from home in our virtual, in our sense, in our laptop, um, in our environment, but also how can we start filling these gaps and making the state better? So we can keep going forward. Yeah, so uh, I'm Yuri, right? One of the other team members. And uh, what we did basically when we started this project is we wanted to look at different areas where VR might be useful to kind of help uh, Maryland and the people of Maryland, right? Uh, so we looked at a few different areas. We kind of divided the work up and uh, we looked here at the bottom at growth potential in healthcare and entertainment, how we can use VR there. Uh, we used how kind of moving everything to this virtual uh, reality is going to change the impact on the environment, right? For example, carbon emission would reduce with everyone working from home. But then as Ryan mentioned, right, there's, there's going to be this huge change in the workforce and there's going to be these giant job markets in ER and healthcare that, or in IT and healthcare that are going to open up and we wanted to look for areas where we can kind of use virtual reality to train people to uh, kind of prepare for these new opening job markets, right? So if you go to the next slide, uh, one area that I focused on in particularly was uh, these massive open online courses, right? So these are basically these online platforms that offer free or very cheap courses uh, to teach people skills that they might need in a new job or, or in a new uh, uh, job market, right? And it was particularly interesting to me since I am a grad student, right? So I have experienced teaching and I'm still teaching. A lot of my friends teach. Uh, so looking at these open online courses, we realized this is a huge growing market, right? It's uh, worth about 3.6 billion in 2018, uh, projected to be worth about 25 billion by 2025. Uh, so what we did is we realized we can use these courses to train people to enter new uh, job areas, right? So basically what we did is we... Uh, gave some recommendations to Mel, right, uh, the, our client, uh, to kind of help uh, reach, the, like, first of all, reach the right people to enter these courses, like get the people that need to be educated to enter a new job market educated. Uh, we found some areas where we can improve the completion rate of these MOCs to get the people that sign up for these courses to actually finish the courses and learn the skills that they need. And then finally, uh, we uh, identified some ways we can facilitate accreditation for these uh, online courses where uh, the, the courses are actually going to be worth something to the employer as well as the student. So then Ryan's going to take it back over for the next slide. And then we're looking at a current employer. How can we use our VR in our current setting? And that's what we wanted to give Mel in terms of what are different aspects. So in terms of simulations, Walmart Academy is one of the biggest ones. Using that headset, training their employees. But what else interesting, one of the biggest recommendations we provided to her was using soft skills. It's a thing you don't think about in terms of virtual reality. And actually, based on a model that uh, PwC used, you could actually train people in soft skill simulation, understanding how to deal with those very sensitive issues that are ever so changing our current dynamic and how to push them going forward. And wrapping up on the last slide, Nima, one of the biggest things too is entertainment. You know, VR is supposed to be fun and it's such an innovative sector. Um, and as, as a lot of us have seen over the past year, we've had to find new ways to entertain ourselves. Um, and as you see, 74% of people are willing to pay for virtual reality. We actually put an entire model out for our client in terms of how this could look, because it's not going to replace going to sporting events, it's not going to replace going to concerts, but different ways that we can use it for the future and for the better. And finally, just again, just to conclude, uh, last slide, you mind? Just pulling on a quote from a Maryland student himself, you know, Vernon Arif, 
there's VR, there's decades ahead of us in terms of innovation. And we just scratched the surface here in Maryland of what our client could do for it going forward, and eventually how we can help change the state for the better. And that wraps us up. Thanks so much, Ryan. Passing it over to the judges. Great research, uh, everyone. Um, so, you know, skilling, these kind of skilling and employability programs always need to kind of be market or like industry oriented uh, on the employer side. Um, so how confident are you that employers will like value the kind of MOOCs and the kind of accreditation that that gives uh, compared to other kind of traditional, um, you know, degree programs or, or skilling kind of programs and so forth? Uh, I can answer this one. Uh, so this was one of the problems we ran into looking at these MOCs, right? So uh, the, these platforms, they have a, a huge potential, but there are some issues, right? And one of this is the one you identified where uh, employees don't necessarily see the value in them, right? So one of the recommendations we made to Mel is that there's this opportunity where these MOCs can actually partner with employees to kind of help, the, uh, help each other build these courses. So that the courses actually teach the things that the employees want, right? And that way the employees can say, look, we need these and these and these skills, right? So if you teach people this, right, we're going to be more likely to hire them. And this will both kind of makes it more likely that employees are going to hire students that finish the courses. And it will be more likely that the students actually want to take these courses and want to finish these courses because it can actually help them get a job. For sure. Yeah. Industry inputs on these kind of skilling and training programs are always key. Right, yeah. On the curriculums and so forth. Yeah, exactly. What were some of your suggestions to increase, increase the uh, completion rates? And then tell me a little bit about the personal growth that each of you had. Uh, so as far as completion rate goes, uh, we had uh, a few suggestions, right? So one major thing that uh, student, like we looked at what's, why students weren't completing them. And one major thing they indicated uh, was that they kind of felt, felt like they were studying in a void like rather than like an online university or like an in-person university, you have a teacher and you can talk to them and you get it back and forth. And uh, you don't really have that, right? So we made suggestions where uh, students can kind of be more engaged by having either a peer-to-peer -peer review kind of process, or you can hire people that are just there to kind of, uh, for the students to bounce ideas off of, or like if they want feedback on their projects, these, these teachers can kind of give them feedback, right? And this would be kind of a minimalistic way for teachers to be involved, right? They don't have to do the actual lecturing, it just be giving feedback, right? So this was one way. Uh, another way to improve completion was to actually use VR, right? So uh, it was said that uh, if students actually use VR or, or learn in like a virtual environment, rather than just reading or listening to lectures, they're gonna be much more engaged and much more likely to you know, stay with the course and actually complete it. So these were two major things that we suggested we can do to actually increase the completion rate of these courses. Uh, and oh, then, yeah, you go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, talk about my uh, personal growth, right? So uh, I'm coming from a biology background, so I'm doing something completely different here and I was not very familiar with all of it. So pretty much anything I was doing was, was you know, new to me. So I learned a lot, but I think one major area that I learned a lot was doing research, right? I'm, I'm from a, I'm a scientist, right? I'm a molecular biologist. So I do research in a very specific way. So it was really hard for me to switch to this new way of finding like, uh, like this data that would actually back up these ideas that we had. So this new way of doing research uh, was really new to me, but I think that that's something where I really grew during this project. And I think one of the biggest growths that I had was just a conversation we had with our team. So we sat down with our alumni consultant and I, and I asked this, the seniors that just finished their you know, summer long internship, what do you guys want to do about going to the office? And they were so like, I want to go fully in person, like hand on the table. They're like, I miss that interaction experience, which then I was talking to Mike Sultan who works for EY. And, you know, I've been going to the office a couple of days. I work for the university and we're both like most people in, you know, their mid twenties is they're like, I, I kind of like the virtual setting. I kind of like not commuting and not. And I think it's just a very interesting sensation. I think that's what our, our country is going to start to as companies start to shift going forward, is this something that's going to be here to stay? Do people are going to miss the human interaction more than they think? Or are people going to miss their dog or, you know, eating at home more? I think it was just a fascinating conversation. I think it was just a minor case study in what I think is going to be our government and our, you know, workforce for the next couple, you know, short couple of years. Thank you.
could you also uh, share some learnings about how you went about uh, understanding the industry better in general? Because from what I understand, all of you were probably coming in from different backgrounds. And from a technology point of view, it's a rapidly evolving space. So how did you keep yourselves uh, up to date uh, during the short period of the project that you were involved in it? Yeah, so we, we just tried to talk to experts. So we actually, um, Mel set us up with um, one of her IT consultants that sits on our board. And he basically said a lot of things of, you know, giving us things that, again, went, went a lot over my head in terms of understanding the security restrictions, understanding the cost, the upfront cost, the high barriers of entry of some of these products. And then also from a, you know, as things start to go virtual, what are the barriers of entry in terms of what do, like, especially in terms of thinking about things that are authorizations, like in the healthcare sector, you know, things can be virtual, but they're not accredited. So they won't be all new fascinating things. So they, we just try to talk as many people as we could. Great, thank you. Thanks team. Up next, we have Green Logic. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Emmanuel, and I'm here with my team presenting about the company Green Logic. Next slide, please. So, just to start off with their mission statement, this company was recently founded by Mr. Ron Goodman, who owns part of Ivy City Smokehouse um, in Washington, D.C. The company's mission is to revitalize soil, reduce food and carbon waste footprint, recycle phosphorus, and also aid in the revitalization of the Chesapeake Bay. And the way the company plans to do this is through the creation and distribution of a compostable plastic bag. Next slide, please. So just an overview of how their model is intended to work once they fully scale up operations. First of all, first off, Green Logic, the company itself, will be responsible for the manufacturing of these bags. And they will also be selling them to restaurants and various distributors around the area that um, also have food waste, such as hotels. And then from there, those restaurants and other companies. Um, their clients will be able to pick up that compost um, from the restaurants with the bag. And these other distributors will also be responsible for driving this compost to uh, centers to drop off that waste. And finally, at the composting facilities, um, they will be the ones who are responsible for taking the compost to help revitalize the soil and take advantage of the nutrients. And the bags are proposed to be, or what will be engineered to be disposed through the use of hydrogen peroxide, which is a harmless chemical that can be used to break down this type of plastic. And now to talk about our process is our one of our co-leads, Chung Hao. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. And in this process, first we discuss with our client, Dr. Uh, Ron Goodman to define our project scope. And the scope is to build up a feasible business model for green logic and to solve food waste issue. And next, we start to explore the market. We found that in the United States, restaurants, hotels, and hospitals generate about 29 to 44 billion pounds of food waste every year. Wow. And uh, the majority of food waste goes to landfills. And this is an estimated of $9.2 billion market. After market analysis, we shift our focus to do uh, product research. We interview with Thomas Himmler, the former PG County Head of Economic Development, and Dr. Rick Vaughn about R&D of compostable bag. And we also consult Percy, the advisor of ICF for developing business model. With all this work, we finally can build up uh, a strategy and business model for Green Logic. Next, I will pass to Lydia to talk more about our strategy and recommendation. Thank you, CH. Our client's initial business plan was unconventional and requires Green Logic to overcome a few different complex issues once the prototype of the compostable bag is created. Green Logic is also relying on Maryland Industrial Partnership Program run by the University of Maryland uh, to develop that compostable bag and MIPS originally declined their initial um, proposal to fund that development. Upon successful development of that compostable bag, Green Logic will need to also secure approval from compost facilities to change their process, adding a step to decompose the bag on demand uh, with the use of hydrogen peroxide 
two of the five compostable or composting facilities in the state of Maryland that accept food waste said in initial conversations with our team that they're highly unlikely to make any modifications to our process. Green Logic would also need to secure approval from the Departments of Health, um, including PG County, to transport food for human consumption in the same truck with food waste, which is currently not allowable according to federal and state guidelines. Lastly, they'd also need to determine a process for how to mass manufacture this new compostable bag while keeping that price point beneath a dollar per unit, um, which is the current price for compostable bags. Given all of this, I'll next pass to Sydney, um, who will discuss our alternate recommendations for Green Logic to maximize their impact. Thank you, Lydia. Um, so, based on our previous slides, it is our formal recommendation that Green Logic build a logistics company focused on hauling food waste from restaurants to suitable composting centers. For a food waste collector, clients are the most important part of the business model. Green Logic, as a transporter of food waste, will focus on providing their business to restaurants. And since the owners of Green Logic work in the restaurant industry and the food distribution business, they have created valuable relationships with other restaurant owners. This, these relationships um, span over 800 restaurants and they can be leveraged to build a clientele at a faster rate compared to other competitors. We also highly recommend the purchase of electric garbage trucks in order to align their operations more strongly with their mission, which includes reducing food waste and reducing the carbon footprint. Furthermore, operating with electric garbage, tr garbage trucks uh, differentiates Green Logic from its competitors. Green Logic will be able to charge restaurants per pickup for compost delivery service, as well as get a municipality contract that helps increase clientele throughout the region and serve as an income, income source through subsidies. For marketing, a website is recommended as the most suitable platform for Green Logic to use. Given the business to business nature of the company, a substantial social media presence does not appear necessary for the business to responsibly forge and maintain relationships with clients. As you can see through careful evaluation of clients, operations, financing, and marketing, it appears as though a logistics company focused on hauling food waste is the best opportunity for the success of this startup. Um, so next slide, please. That is the end of our presentation. Thanks so much. Passing it over to the judges. Well, uh, great work, everyone. Um, so just wanted to clarify. So the, uh, the final recommendation was to essentially pivot from this kind of product to like this, uh, the service of, uh, of the, um, like the logistic service that you described? So Ro, I can take that question. Um, we actually ended up submitting two recommendations to our client. Um, Green Logic was um, unenthusiastic at the challenges that we proposed with their original business model. Um, and they were really unwilling to accept that those were hurdles that could not be overcome. Um, so we sent back their MIPS proposal, um, which was declined with recommendations um, for how to possibly secure that funding. But we did also believe very strongly that with all of our research that this recommendation for a waste hauling company was the best way to actually meet the mission of their company. So I hope that answers your question. It was a bit of a challenging um, project over the last few weeks. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of um, expectation setting, client, client management along with that. Um, and sorry, just the, the other question I had was, um, so, you know, that's, uh, this kind of logistics company would require high, high startup costs, you know, uh, capital investments and, uh, and so forth. Um, how do you think like they can implement some lean pilots to like establish that proof of concept um, that there is, that, that there is some market viability uh, to this all. Yeah, I can take that. So in our initial conversations after recommending it, um, Dr. Roman basically expressed that if we were to pursue a logistics company, it, it's kind of like, how should I put this? That model already exists with like general waste and whatnot. So kind of scaling it down to just compost would be suitable. Plus, we believe that his partnership um, or involvement rather with Ivy City Smokehouse and a few other restaurants in the D.C. area can serve as that immediate pilot to kind of just scale and test out how costs and the entire 
hauling process works at a very small level. And it's really advantageous that he's already involved with restaurants, his target demographic for the bag, but also this logistics company per se to help him scale that. I'll also Great. just add on top of that, that Maryland has recently passed House Bill 264, which is gonna require large producers of food waste to divert their food waste to composting facilities. Um, and that's gonna be scaling up over the next five years as well. These projects are so fun. We just never have enough time to really dig into all the questions we'd like to ask. Um, so I'll just cut to the personal growth question. You know, where, where did each of you grow and, and where did you see yourself uh, evolve to through this process? Um, personally, um, I'm a nutrition and food science major um, and I'm also kind of working on my own startup. So I just learned a lot about the connection between, or I guess the difference between sustainability and reality um, in this case, because we had to deliver a lot of uh, difficult conversations to our client, um, as well as the intersection between passion and maybe um, like looking at other opportunities when you're presented with a lot of different options that could enhance or it changes your vision in any way, you should definitely like be receptive to feedback instead of um, not receptive, I guess. Uh, could you also share your thought process? So very interestingly, uh, you, you decided to uh, choose a very different path on the problem statement that was posed in front of you. Uh, could you take us a little bit through your thought process in arriving to a conclusion which was so different from the problem solution that the client has posed in front of you? Sure. Um, so, you know, really it came about from all of our research, you know, um, we were fortunate enough um, to be able to talk to people who work at UMD Dining Services who are dealing in mass amounts of food waste. Um, Chung Hao was able to talk with people who manage um, compost and, and food waste in Taiwan. Um, and so we really took a look at global models for how to deal with massive amounts of food waste. Because at the end of the day, our client talked about their mission being diverting food waste to support our environment and to rebuild Chesapeake Bay. Um, and as we looked at all of the models that exist out there for sustainability around food waste, logistics and diverting, diverting food waste out of landfills is really what's needed. Um, but in order to do that, someone needs to start taking up large quantities of that product and putting it into the composting facilities in the state of Maryland. Um, and, you know, there are little compost transportation companies, but they are fairly small, um, you know, except for a couple of private institutions like University of Maryland diverts all of their food waste already to the PG County composting facility, which is one of the largest on the East Coast. Um, but there isn't a lot of that happening. And so that's how we came around to the logistics model. And, um, oh, also, I, sorry. Uh, I did not get a final sense of how the client uh, took on the recommendation. Uh, were they of accepting of it or were, was there still a difference in point of views? We have a very strong difference um, in perspective than our client, which is why we also produced a final product about all of the recommendations and all of the challenges that they'll need to overcome. Um, everything that will need to be true in order for their original business model to work. And we supplied recommendations for modifications for their MIPS grant to hopefully help them secure that funding. But we did also put together this business plan um, for the logistical model because we, we do strongly believe that is the route they should end up taking. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, team. All right, up next, we have our Noble Uprising team. Thank you. Empowering homeless women through career workshops requires dedication, compassion, and nobling up. I'm Veronica, the lead for the Noble Uprising ICF team. And during these past few weeks, I've been working with my teammates, Namdi, Amanda, Susie, Caitlin, and Tatia 
in creating a digital marketing campaign for Noble Uprising that will better serve their cause. So now I'll turn it over to Amanda. So we consulted for Noble Uprising, which was founded by alumni Audrea Waysom during her undergrad, and she continued to grow the organization after graduating from the Smith School of Business. And so um, the Noble Uprising's mission, mission statement was to empower women overcoming homelessness and impoverishment with career readiness, resources, and sustainable job opportunities. Um, and they also partner with businesses to understand their employment needs, then train homeless women to meet those needs. Next slide, please. When working with Noble Uprising, our goal was to launch a digital marketing campaign called CEE People, which is an acronym for Serve, Educate, and Empower. Throughout the fellowship, we encountered many challenges such as an unclear scope of the project itself, uncovering a large funding issues, and feeling overwhelmed since we had very limited marketing experience. A marketing campaign can be a massive project which would require us to tackle time constraints and realizing who our target audience would be. As a group, we also experienced limitations such as a short time span of the 10-week program, having limited uh, to no experience in consulting and realizing our limited scope and analysis. Despite the challenges, our group has discovered a lot of insight. As a team, we not only grew individually, but also collectively throughout our weekly meetings and brainstorming sessions. We continued to learn about ourselves and each other along the way as we met our end goal. Lastly, the skills and client interaction we have gained from this fellowship will positively reflect on our career goals in the future. So for our primary research, we created surveys that propose questions to potential business partners as well as individual donors about what they would want out of a partnership with a nonprofit organization like Noble Uprising. We developed these questions based on what we learned from our secondary research findings. Other nonprofit organizations conducted surveys to create successful, successful marketing campaigns, so we wanted Noble Uprising to do the same. We believe that these questions will benefit Noble Uprising and local businesses and how they could create a mutually beneficial relationship. Next, we conducted a search optimization audit. We looked at on and off page optimization, organic traffic, and frequency of keywords in search engine result pages. We then used this information to identify areas of improvement on the Noble Uprising website. For our secondary research, we analyzed marketing techniques from other nonprofit organizations, such as Habitat for Humanity, Seven Hills Homeless Center, Baltimore Outreach Services, and Women's Housing Coalition. We researched techniques such as the use of social media and using real stories to raise awareness in order to apply them to Noble Uprising and plan a digital campaign rollout. Now Veronica will discuss our final recommendations. Based on our primary and secondary research, we realized three key areas for improvement, which crafted our final recommendations to Noble Uprising. Our first recommendation revolved around social media and the planning of a digital marketing campaign for their See People initiative. We created an actionable plan for Noble Uprising and how they could increase postings on social media platforms like Facebook or Twitter by creating a TikTok business account. Video advertisements or content, which can be created through TikTok, are more likely to have higher engagement more shares and greater click-through rates. Uh, this would encourage backlinking, survey engagement, and shares with the hashtag NobleUp. Noble Uprising can share stories, experiences, and facts about women's homelessness to increase awareness and user engagement. This directly integrates with our second recommendation, which is becoming search optimized. When conducting our search engine audit, we realized that Noble Uprising was not at the forefront of the Google search. We created an outline and how using latent semantic indexing or LSI keywords by publishing longer content, adding multimedia elements like embedding or linking those TikTok videos and creating external and internal links on the website can help improve their on-page ranking. Finally, our last recommendation discussed utilizing LinkedIn to establish and promote relationships with local businesses, especially those that are also women owned. By establishing these relationships, Noble Uprising can utilize our partnership surveys that we created to learn more about what these businesses would want to see in new employees. This will allow Noble Uprising to curate their career workshops to meet the specific needs of their business partners. This will increase successful job placement for the women that complete the Noble Uprising career training programs. Throughout this project, we felt deeply aligned with Noble Uprising's mission. We believe that Noble Uprising is serving its community through, through its mission. 
And we hope that this digital marketing campaign will increase awareness about poverty and homelessness. Noble Uprising can serve homeless women by seeing them for who they really are and by providing them with the tools to be educated, employed, and empowered. Thank you. Thanks so much, team. I'll pass it over to the judges. Cool, great work, everyone. Um, wanted to see, uh, this might, this is more just a clarification point. Who were the, like, uh, who is the target audience of this digital um, marketing campaign? The target for the digital marketing audience um, would mainly be utilizing TikTok. And although that seems very broad because TikTok is used by millions of users, we kind of imagined that in general, the target audience would be people in their late 20s, probably in their 30s as well. Um, and we also kind of imagined that by creating TikTok videos, it would then be expanded onto other platforms as well. So kind of creating a social media kind of link in creation where you can take those TikTok videos and content and post it on um, the Facebook page of Noble Uprising. They could also post it onto their website. They could post those same videos onto their LinkedIn. So while if someone's just viewing it on TikTok, it might seem like it's directed towards a younger audience, it can actually be shared to much larger range of uh, viewers. Cool. Uh, one question. Um, so could you talk about maybe what was like the most unique aspect of your all digital marketing campaign as compared to, you know, all the research that you all did? And could you talk a little bit about that creativity process that led you to that? I would definitely say that utilizing TikTok actually felt very unique in what we were doing. Um, we actually had a, a hard time at first figuring out how to have a unique or different campaign. And it was Amanda um, who really brought up and started talking about one of, you know, utilizing TikTok um, just because it is so engaging and how video content is much more appealing. It's a lot easier to digest and use. Um, and as far as, I'm trying to think. I apologize. What was the second half of your question? Uh, what was like the creativity process that led to this kind of unique, uh, uh, you know, recommendation of I utilizing think, TikTok? I think as far as what we did for creativity, uh, it was definitely a combination of all of us brainstorming with each other. Um, I, I think being able to read and reflect on what other nonprofit organizations had done to increase their own awareness, we realized that actually marketing a cause, not necessarily the, the, the organization itself, is much more impactful. And that's what leads to things that can be trending or that can be more, you know, followable for, for other people. Would you please speak to us about your personal growth? Um, so for me, I'm a criminology and criminal justice major, so I'm like very far from like the business aspect. But I did realize um, being in the fellowship, a lot of the skills and like the client interaction that we engage is something that I can use a lot. Um, I'm applying to law schools in October. And obviously being an attorney, you do have to engage with your client and then figure out what the problem is with your client. How can you, you know, set these goals for your client or in the attorney's perspective, how to win the case. So I guess using and learning the leadership skills and like learning how to be organized, learning how to talk with clients, learning how to identify problems is something that is very reflective on being an attorney or even any other career that deals with dealing with somebody, if that makes sense. Um, and you also highlighted uh, some of the challenges that you faced in gathering information and uh, putting together some of the work that you needed to. So how did you go about handling some of those challenges in the short period of time that you had on hand? We actually ended up dividing ourselves in, in our own group. Um, we would meet weekly to come together and share each other what we had, either researched what we found, talked about, you know, what our next steps would be. But we ultimately realized there was a point where we had to div divide and conquer. Um, myself and Nandi ended up being two kind of leads for a couple of weeks while we went through and did even further research and kind of guided our own separate little teams. Otherwise, I don't think we would have been able to gather enough information that we needed to be able to provide Noble Uprising with these recommendations. 
And as part of the recommendations, uh, did you have different content strategies for different channels? Uh, so for example, a LinkedIn strategy might be different from a TikTok strategy. Uh, so did you uh, put together that as part of your recommendations? Yes, um, we definitely kind of envisioned those two strategies almost being separate as in TikTok would be more to raise awareness. It would be more to increase individual donors um, because Noble Uprising takes donors from grants, funding, of course, but as well as donations. Um, and then the LinkedIn strategy was more geared towards potential business partners. So Noble Uprising pairs with other organizations, um, University of Maryland being one of those organizations from the past. And that's how they kind of have, they, they cultivate the women that they take into their programs and try to make it so that way they would fit into their work environment. And we wanted LinkedIn to be that kind of bridge helping Noble Uprising connect to other businesses so they could better cultivate that message. So we did kind of outline two separate plans, um, like kind of actionable items through calendars and when they would have to keep track of you know, do this by then or how you should communicate and kind of reach out, um, especially using some of the LinkedIn features that were that we found so that way they could build those relationships and kind of start some type of communication with other businesses that are local to Maryland where the uh, Noble Uprising is founded. So, And I can add to that, um, when we were doing this, we also had to research and be knowledgeable of the differences between LinkedIn and TikTok, because obviously LinkedIn and TikTok have to different audiences. TikTok is more, you know, just having fun, you know, just kind of like a scrolling app where you just see fun videos, but then LinkedIn is a very professional and business aspect website. So I think our team made sure that the recommendations that we did were specifically geared towards the two. And for example, TikTok could have like videos of like a day in the life of a homeless woman, or like maybe like how did, um, how did Noble Uprising impact me? Like kind of like that kind of videos for people to share. And then LinkedIn was more like, you know, like Veronica said, connecting with other businesses. So I think researching and really understanding the two to keep them separate was a big thing just because it didn't confuse anyone and integrate it to make things more complicated. And uh, lastly, uh, what was the client reaction to uh, some of these recommendations? Um, in general, our client has been very open to our recommendations. Um, she's really was, in all honesty, she, when we first talked to her and had our initial client meeting, she really wasn't sure where she wanted this campaign to go. She didn't know who the audience should be or could be or wasn't really sure what this campaign would be about. Um, we did kind of mention a little bit earlier as well that in that initial client meeting, we discovered the larger funding issue, um, which was at first something we thought we could tackle or try to help her out with. But I think ultimately we realized that we could still address that funding issue by creating or showing her what a successful digital campaign could be. So that way she could increase her awareness, hopefully increase donor organizations, increase those partnerships to kind of meet both of those needs. But in general, she was welcome to hear about these things. She was actually very particularly interested in the search engine optimization because that was something she was curious about as well. And hopefully those can address kind of helping increase her business awareness. Thank you, thanks guys. Thank you. Thanks so much team. Up next, we have Hope Hydration. Hi everyone, my name is Bryce Corbett and I will be introducing to you the company called Hope Hydration. Next slide, please. This is the complete team that has had the honor of working with Hope Hydration during this summer program. Next slide. Wouldn't it be great if you were able, um, if everyone had access to clean water? Hope is a startup company that is leveraging technology to bring sustainable, clean drinking water to the world. Hope has designed the Hydra Station, a cutting edge water fountain, and it is working to install networks of stations in urban hubs around the world. Next slide. The key features of the Hydra Station are providing high quality clean water with potential premium add-ons and data generalization, all without having to touch the machine. Next slide. Our team had the unique opportunity to work with George Richardson, the CEO and founder of Hope. With him, we created four main tracks that the team worked on for Hope Hydration. These tracks are finance, research, communications, and business development. For finance, 
we were asked to identify different strategies of securing investments for Hope Hydration and to create a financial model that we would give the team at Hope a better understanding of the cost and the potential revenue associated with each station type. For the research track, we were asked to conduct general market research on the water industry and research potential cities that could function as early adopters for the hydro stations. For the communication tracks, we were asked to develop a marketing plan that we can use to build a story for Hope. For the business development, we were asked to determine how much revenue can be generated through advertising, premium add-ons, and data collection. Then, using the research, the financial model, and the story, we could create a viable plan that Hope will use to grow the company. Next slide, please. Before we could dive into the work, the group needed to understand the project scope and think about how we can benefit the stakeholders. These stakeholders are being people that need water, advertising agencies looking to post ads, and IoT companies that need data. With this mindset, we were able to develop the following deliverables. For finance, the team developed a pipeline of investors that specifically funded environmental tech and humanitarian business. This would streamline the process of finding investors for Jorge and his team to pitch the idea for Hope with a greater chance of acquiring funding. The pipeline is organized into different levels of funding. We have angels, seed funds, and series A and B. This will provide Hope team with venture capitalists that are ready to connect at each stage of their business. Next slide, please. For research, the team did a market analysis and determined several companies that are key players in the water industry, as well as emergency, emerging companies that are working with similar products. In the analysis, the team identified key features that could be used by the business development team. Examples include, but are not limited to, water temperature, pH levels, population density, and data collection. In the research, the team found smart cities that would be ideal clients as early adopters. Next slide. For communication, the team had the opportunity to understand the brand behind Hope through the vision of Jorge. The team identified a few brands whose market efforts resonate with Hope's brand. We found that breathtaking images coupled with awe-inspiring stories would build anticipation for the reveal of the hydro station. The team that would strategy and develop a storyboard that ties together different industries and cities around the world that blends the team together to show everyone in the world despite our differences are all connected by water. Next slide, please. For the business development, the team used the key features that the market researched and did a uh, revenue analysis on them to recommend the features that would provide the greatest user experience and maximize profits. The team identified big outdoor companies that promote sustainable, sustainability as potential brands that would advertise the hydro stations, as well as big data companies that would be able to purchase the data that is collected. Using the smart city research, we identified Northern Virginia as a growing data hub that has a reliable water source to be one of the first locations for the hydro station. Next slide, please. Despite the immense amount of work that the team has already pulled off, we still have a few more deliverables that we would like to finish up for the Hope Hydration team. So with Jorge's approval, our team unanimously decided that we want to continue our work with Jorge for the next couple of weeks to finish up the rest of our deliverables. We are going to converge all of, the, um, all of our work so far that we have done to create a blueprint for Hope to use and to grow the expansion of the company in a sustainable way. Thank you all for listening. Thanks so much, team. I'll pass it to the judges. Great rigor. Um, so wanted to uh, wanted to understand what what do you see as one of the biggest sources of revenue for uh, for Hope? So their goal is to be able to um, have talks with large cities like Los Angeles, New York, um, you know Miami, for example, and they want to be able to either have two different layouts for these cities either the city purchases the hydro station directly and installs it themselves, or Hope kind of puts the hydro station in the city for free, but they charge them a yearly um, kind of, uh, um, basically they charge them yearly for it. And that way they can continue maintenance on the own, but then the city just continues paying for it. Was there anyone that you kind of recommended or prioritized over another? Um, 
as of right now, he's still looking at both models because he's building up two different types of bottles. One of them being the Benoit and then the other one being the, um, uh, forget the name of it, but basically there it's a smaller model versus a larger model. And he's focusing really hard on creating the prototype as of right now, but he has not um, focused on which model that he likes best for selling the revenue for the cities yet. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit more about your personal growth through this experience? Yeah, so personally, um, I really want to become a financial advisor. That is um, something that I'm really looking forward to. And being able to talk with Jorge, he, um, he's an industry leader in water. And then with his company, it's just he has a mindset of what he wants to get financially. And that is what I want to do. I want to be able to have uh, talks with clients and see the growth potential that they have and see what type of financial future they want. And that's what I would help them with. So personally, this is just absolutely fantastic for me to be able to work with him financially and just see what he wants to grow with his company. So that's how I've been able to grow. Thank you. Uh, so could you also share uh, where the company was currently or at the time you started the project, uh, especially on the finance piece and raising funds? Where was the company when you started the project and where was it when you are concluding it? Definitely. So for the financial stage, uh, they were a little bit limited on the capital that they've raised. And I was able to provide them with the five stages, like I mentioned earlier, with the angels. Um, and so he wants to be able to have two different avenues, the angels and then um, venture capitalist. And then right now he's in the seed stage, which is basically having a prototype, but they do not have any sales revenue and they have limited amount of capital raised. And so I want to be able to get them to the series A stage, which is having about a million dollars raising capital. And then also their prototype being able to have some type of sales for it. So that was my goal. I raised them about um, 75 different venture capitalists to get them into the next stage of their uh, uh, startup company. And uh, were you also, as part of this whole process, able to create a pitch book for the company? Uh, were, were you able to work on any of that part? Or was it more about uh, putting together a database of companies which could be of potential interest? He really wanted me to focus on building up the database. So that way him and his team could take a look a little bit further into the companies and see if they would be a good fit. Um, if they really are interested in water or if they're interested in the data collection, maybe the companies are more interested into the advertisements. So I kind of built them a large portfolio of these different companies for them to take a look at. Um, I give them their websites, how much normally they invest in and just information like that. So him and his team are gonna be able to look at this list for years on end and then uh, determine if they see it's a good fit of these companies to invest with. Great, thank you. Thanks for this. Thanks so much, Hope Hydration team. Up next, we have our Get Cities team. Thank you and welcome everyone to our presentation today. So uh, I have with me in the team is Daryl Weyron, Ariane Jit, and Rushi. So first, we're going to talk about the background of the organization and the scope of the project. So Get Cities is the shortened form of uh, gender equality in tech cities. They are an initiative in accelerating the uh, representation and leadership of women in tech through the development of inclusive tech hubs across the United States. They currently have one in Chicago, and now we are uh, they are launching to uh, Washington, D.C. They have three main goals, which are building the pathways into tech for, um, for women, aligning local tech ecosystem, and create long-term systematic change. With these goals in mind and with what they are doing right now, they have a large database with lots of information for, from many different organizations in their CM system and currently the connections between these organizations are a little bit weak. So what we need to do for this project is to help the client create a tool to, for them to use internally, which can help them map out the ecosystem. Um, so map out the ecosystem that, so that they can better manage their organizations to serve their purposes. And if this tool is helpful, they can expand it to use it nationally. And because they don't have um, enough resources to go update this tool manually, we need to mitigate the manual tasks as much as possible. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, 
So here's how we approach this project from the beginning. In the first two to three weeks, we identify that we need an, uh, to get an overview of the organization as well as what they need us to do. But the scope seemed a little bit vague. So after going through uh, all the steps, you can see on the screen here, we gradually identify what the, what the scope would look like and what next steps we need to take. Next, in phase two, we spend the next four weeks to gain a deeper understanding of what an ecosystem should look like, what skills and platforms needed to create one, and narrow down to the most feasible one. In addition to cleaning and analyzing the data we have, we need to decide what features or filters that the ecosystem needs and can serve the purpose of the client best. So, sorry. So we conducted interviews with the client to understand their needs and make sure we cover that in the ecosystem we make. Now, we are currently in the middle of our last phase, phase three, and we are experimenting with the feasible platforms using the existing database we have. We still need to overcome some problems before having our final deliverable. But following these steps here, we believe that we can deliver a good product for our client. And I will pass it to Chit uh, for our re recommendation. So for our final recommendation, our team developed an ecosystem map that caters to our client's needs. Here, we have a lot going on, so let me break it down for you. Each individual circle represents a different organization. The different colors represent the industry the organization is a part of. Here, we have four different colors, each representing industry. We also have various styles of lines to indicate which communities these organizations serve. For example, we have a dotted line representing people of color, a solid line representing LGBTQ, and a double solid line representing people of, representing underrepresented groups and or people. These lines also establish a link between circles, which helps the user indicate that there is a relationship between these different organizations. The words above the circles indicate services each organization offers. So for example, the dark blue circle on the top right of the map is an organization that is part of the finance industry that also offers venture capital services. Here in the bottom right of the map, we have a circles inside a light pink bubble, which indicates the location of the organization. This is a non-accurate map that represents the organizations in the DMV area. Circles inside the light pink bubbles are organizations located in Washington, DC, while the circles outside the bubble are organizations in the surrounding Maryland and Virginia area. In the bottom left of this map, we have organs we are presented with a table that gives us the organization name, industry, and community served. This table, along with the map, will update as the user checks and unchecks various filters. Next slide, please. Moving on. So moving on to our current product, our product was developed in Excel and Tableau. Currently, we have an ecosystem map without the various linking lines in the top left of the image. Below that, we have our table providing the user with key information about the organizations. On the right side of the image, we have all our filters and color-coded legends. Currently, we have five tiers of filters, which are as follows. State slash city, partnership scope, community served, industry, and organization name. In this current image, all the filters on the were left to be unchecked. If the user went through the filters and started to uncheck the boxes, the map and table will begin the change. The problem we currently face is that we're having difficulty creating filters focused on keywords. The filters we explore from Excel keep overlapping with keywords and making it difficult to narrow down the organizations. So one possible solution that we have would be to combine or make a separate column for each uh, community in Excel so that when we import and export into Tableau, it would read each filter separately. Next slide, please. Finally, I wanted to briefly share with you our journey. We faced a lot of initial problems like a lack of basic skills and experience in consulting, broad scope, and a lack of technical knowledge. However, these issues were quickly solved as we progressed through the project. Attending the optional workshop to boost our consulting skills, preparing for each client meeting with a list of questions and ideas, meeting with our alumni consulting advisor, Meg, and researching a foreign topic to develop an ideal solution were all steps our team took to solve our problems, which also added to our personal growth. Thank you, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.
Thanks, team. Um, so based on the uh, ecosystem mapping, uh, what did you find like most unique about um, about uh, Get Cities uh, work and interventions and so forth? I can answer that. So Get Cities has over a hundred orgs that they work with, and currently their issue with them is like they don't have they don't have any relationships between the different orgs. So what they wanted us to do was develop a map that allowed them to, that was a dynamic map that would update when you added each org individually. That allows them, that tells them which each which services each organization offers. So that's what we did with, uh, with the dynamic map that we created. Hi, Rushi, I'll be seeing you in, the, in a couple of weeks. And um, secondly, so, you know, it is a lot of really detailed and uh, a lot of information you said that you're still going to finish out the scope in a couple of weeks. How do you see uh, the recommendation being refined or changing or, or detailing within the next couple of weeks that would, might be different than where it is today? So yeah, I can speak on that. Um, I think one of the problems that we had with the dynamic map is when you're like filtering it out, you can only filter it out by like one word. So like if organiz organization one supported people in color, and people that are in the LGBTQ community, it would only filter out to the, like it would filter out to both of them. It would act as one bubble in the dynamic map. And for our situation, we would like to, to be like two separate bubbles and for organization one to be part of the people in colors bubble and also in the people in LGBTQ bubble. So we're hoping to figure out a way to make separate columns in Excel and then in Tableau, make it under one field. And so when you're filtering out the data and hoping to get more than one community serve, it will make sure that it's under like three or four different bubbles. So, yeah. Thank you. And uh, my question would be that, how do you think uh, this dynamic map can be made to be a live uh, project, which is changing and evolving continuously? Uh, with the with the kind of data that you're handling on something like this, I think data is uh, the biggest challenge that one is dealing with. Uh, so how does your team intend to address that issue uh, with respect to the project? Um, as of currently, our client is currently using um, Airtable as their way to input data. And so we suggested just a two-step process of integrating that to Excel and then also then just integrating Excel to Tableau. And the integration between Excel to Tableau only takes one click of a button, which is like the refresh button, which also adds just new businesses or new data points within the Tableau sheet itself without doing the manual labor of recreating the dynamic map itself. And how many points uh, of data entry does the client have? Are there multiple people who are working on this uh, updation at a point in time or uh, does it happen through a single route? Um, I can't currently, I think it's, I believe it's only one person updating the data itself. And I okay. think they do that by week. Okay. With each event they have. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you team. Up next, we have a mother's promise. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to our final presentation for the Impact Consulting Fellowship. Our client was the Mother's Promise. Next slide, please. Our team consists of myself, Sridhar, uh, Lee Allen, David, Ife, and Apurva. Mother's Promise is a new organization in the DC area that seeks to help youth girls in the elementary school to middle school age group. AMP does this by offering programming courses that help girls with leadership skills, communication skills, and other education skills in a bid to improve their self-image and increase their competencies. Next slide. Our main project can be subdivided into three main areas, programming, fundraising, and marketing. The main challenge AMP faced with programming was the need to balance its resources with developing new and unique courses. So therefore, our main objective for this portion of the project was to develop these courses through research, but also pinpoint the resources, teachers, and curricula needed to make these programs happen. Secondly, the main challenge AMP had with fundraising was having a consistent source of revenue. So therefore, the main objective uh, we settled on was having long-term and short-term fundraising ideas that would optimally improve AMP's uh, goals. And finally, 
In terms of marketing, AMP's main challenge was a lack of a consistent and comprehensive marketing strategy. AMP has had a social media presence since its conception, but has failed to accumulate a large social media following because of a comprehensive marketing strategy. So therefore, our main objective was to develop this marketing strategy in order to increase AMP's attention. And, oh, uh, and as we uh, transition to the next uh, portion of our presentation, I want to hand it off to my team, Ife. Thank you. Thank you, Sridhar. Now moving on to our solutions roadmap, we organize our recommendations into phases that show immediate steps, supporting actions, and long-term recommendations. Starting off with fundraising, we were able to come up with a comprehensive long-term strategy for fundraising that supports the immediate efforts. We recommend that AMP begins by implementing the recommended affiliate program, which will allow AMP to have a residual income stream. For phase two, we recommend utilizing Google Analytics data to track the performance of the website using key information, such as number of new users, knowing that the website needs a certain amount of traffic to see tangible results in the affiliate marketing program. Finally, for phase three, we recommend that AMP gets a new intern to expand support for fundraising and also help implement some more long-term solutions we recommended. So focusing on increasing engagement through donor newsletters and fundraising competitions. Now moving on to the marketing portion. Oh, sorry. The marketing portion. We created a marketing plan that addresses some of AMP's concerns on reach and influence. Phase one includes adopting the proposed marketing plan that leverages AMP's website, email marketing, and social media for a more integrated approach on increasing engagement and exposure. For phase two, the cornerstone of the implementation of the integrated marketing strategy is making AMP's website more dynamic with the creation of original content. According to the Digital Marketing Institute, content and backlinks are critical to increasing search engine and website traffic success. Finally, for phase three of the marketing effort, we determine AMP would benefit from consistently evaluating the impact of the marketing strategy in addition, collecting data on the profiles of those engaged will allow for the strategy and allow for strategy and messaging refinement over time. And for our programming efforts, we were able to alleviate some of the burden of creating programming for the youth to participate in. For phase one, we developed unique programming in areas such as entrepreneurship, soccer, teen health, failure, and science programs. Moving on to phase two, we recommend that AMP measure success through class sizes, participation, student feedback and staff feedback. Another key as aspect of success is longevity. Could AMP keep offering this course year after year? And finally, for phase three of programming, we identified free online websites, supplement learning and utilize network connections to find teachers and resources for classes to utilize future programming. Um, and yeah, now on to the next slide. Having done the project, these are some of the lessons we learned. Number one, asking for help enables us to think outside of the box and come up with unique solutions. For example, our advisor was very helpful in giving us a starting point when we were all a little stuck in the beginning on the fundraising e efforts. For number two, networking and leveraging connections can lead to mutually beneficial outcome. For example, a team member was able to find a professor in his own personal network that could help support the programming. In addition, the tight timeline allowed us to focus on what really mattered and prioritized in order to identify the areas of greatest need. Lastly, because we were working with a new organization, we found ourselves working more creatively and considering pathways and new perspectives we otherwise wouldn't have. Next slide, please. And yes, yeah, so to conclude, we'd like to just give a special thank you to A Mother's Promise and the Center for Social Value Creation Team and our consulting advisor in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you, team. Passing it back to the judges. Cool. Um, it's a nice uh, roadmap that you, that you all outlined there for implementation. Uh, and just wanted to ask, like, what would you say are some of the biggest risks in implementation, given that it's you know an earlier stage and I imagine a little bit more resource constrained organization? I can take this one. So in terms of programming, I think the biggest risk right now is the unstable COVID situation and also the uncertainty of actually uh, uh, following up through with the uh, resources we found so far. So I know AMP right now is settled on an in-person uh, schedule for fall 2021, but uh, this might not pan out as uh, they would expect. So that's kind of uncertain. 
And this kind of coincides with the resources we saw, found so far. And in my experience, I know the professor I reached out to uh, was unsure about a uh, in-person semester. And so therefore uh, wasn't fully committed to uh, in-person teaching, but was always keeping that option open. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, for the fundraising effort, I would say one of the risks is making sure that there's enough traffic to the website because um, affiliate programs uh, really need a lot of traffic to support. And some of them that we recommended actually need a minimum number of um, like people who are using the link to purchase or buy like the product or service. So I'm um, just making sure that they're utilizing all their efforts to just get enough traffic to the website would probably be the biggest risk for the fundraising effort. I don't really have a question. I just think um, the group was very professional and I love the attire, everyone dressed up for the party. Um, I thought it was great that you uh, provided a, a job for an intern. That's uh, wise planning, great job. Uh, could you talk about uh, some of the skills that you had to develop or work on as a team uh, while executing this project? I can take this one. So I think uh, the biggest thing we had to do was really uh, communicate with each other about um, about our progress as well as our own personal schedules. I know in the beginning of the project, we were having trouble uh, scheduling meetings with both our clients as well as with each other. And so really uh, using our group chats, using all the resources we had to, we settled down and uh, put together a project uh, was a huge skill we had to learn in order to be successful. I can, I can add on to that as well. Hi, I'm Lee Ellen, I'm the team lead. Um, I think also because this particular project was kind of split up into these three different groups, it really required a lot of organization and coordination on our part because even though we are in these three different kind of sections of the same project, they're very interrelated, very connected. Um, and so to be able to kind of work with our specific points of contact within a mother's promise, but then also come back together and really, as Sridhar said, communicate really well in order to make sure that our final product really plays off of each other, supports, supports each piece and really um, is comprehensive. I think uh, we, we ended up doing a good job of that, but it was definitely a little bit of a learning curve and took effort. So I'm proud of the team for that. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, team. Up next, we have our Be More Empowered team. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Gabrielle, and I'll be introducing my team's work with our client, Be More Empowered. Next slide, please. This is the rest of my team Catherine, Annie, Angela, Muhammad, and Andrew. Next slide, please. So our client Be More Empowered works to strengthen women and girls of color with entrepreneurial and mindfulness tools for future financial and career success. Through academic community building and individual growth programming, Be More aids its participant in achieving entrepreneurial independence. So our project was pretty data oriented. The client emphasized using data as a storytelling device to communicate impact to potential stakeholders, primarily donors and sponsors. So it was important for us to really understand the data of BMOR and its mentees so that we can best suggest a solution. So as such, the scope of our team's activities primarily included reviewing the data that BMOR provided to us, understanding how it currently fits and may potentially fit into achieving its goals and its client's goals, and then researching and recommending data and collection analysis solutions and potential other methods of furthering said goals. Next slide, please. Yeah, so before we go over some more of our specific and technical recommendations that we came to, I'm going to quickly go over some of the more general guidelines that we reached, most of which have to do with like the accessibility of surveys and ease of access. So over our research, we kind of found that the biggest room or area with room for growth is with uh, user friendliness and ease of access. So we just want to ensure that with these surveys to the stakeholders that that's prioritized. Uh, also, we wanna allow for constant updates throughout the projects. So not just like a survey at the beginning, a survey at the end, kinda of wanna see how the path, like how the journey is going throughout the process with constant updates. And then we also wanna make sure to include relevant information 
uh, within the surveys. So uh, just asking the right type of questions. We also uh, came up with some mock interview questions as well. Uh, next slide. So the more questions that we asked our client, uh, the more that our scope changed. So when we first uh, met with our client, I, we were convinced that we were going to provide them with a customer relationship management tool. We were thinking something like Salesforce uh, to integrate a bunch of data, uh, specifically looking at, at data, how they can collect information from their, um, from, the, from their clients in order to create compelling stories for potential donors. Um, however, we found that they currently are using many effective software tools uh, to collect that data. Um, and so in combination with our qualitative recommendations, we're instead recommending that they adopt additional survey analytics software, specifically that works with the tools that they already have and the tools that they're transitioning into. Um, one reason why our, our recommendations are recommendations and we haven't implemented them yet is, is because our client is working on a transition into a Microsoft environment, Microsoft's online software suite. So our software that we recommend uh, would be Max QDA, which is the industry standard for what's called mixed uh, research methods, could combine both qualitative and quantitative data, could take survey data from many different sources. It can also collect data from transcriptions of audio or video interviews that the client uh, would like to, to hold. Um, if they would like to expand taking surveys into a more uh, organization-wide endeavor uh, for growth, then we also recommend or instead recommend Qualtrics Core XM, which it provides similar functionality to Max QDA, but is part of a much broader software suite. Um, but we hope that our qualitative and technical recommendations will allow our will allow our client to better advertise their mission and get the word out about the good work that they do. So, with that, are there any questions? Thanks, team. Great. Um, so, um, similar kind of question I asked to another uh, team earlier, what, what were some of the major impact metrics or data points they should collect to kind of showcase the effectiveness of their work? So, one of the very interesting measures and one of the kind of central points of Be More Empowered is to improve mindfulness um, within the populations they serve, um, which is a very interesting thing to try and figure out data points for um, because how do you say oh here's how we test from like here's how we show mindfulness um, and so that specifically was something we talked about because wanting to have a long-term measure of um, just seeing because you don't want to you know look at someone who comes in with a lot of mindfulness and then try and put oh, well, there's no improvement. Well, they already kind of had those skills in place. And so making sure that we're looking at how someone develops over time through the program instead of just looking at, oh, here's how they are at the end of the program. Um, but that was a really big data point that we wanted to make sure that we had um, as well as just um, kind of the way the clients who are kind of nonprofits in themselves work with our organization and understanding the impact it has on the surrounding community. Great. Can you share with us your personal growth as a team? Definitely. Um, Angela, if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I can start. Um, so I, I'm a master's in business administration candidate. Um, however, I have little to no consulting experience, uh, especially in this, uh, in this sphere of providing business strategy recommendations. Um, we had a, a really nice opportunity to work with a mentor through this process to, to meet with someone who did have that consulting background. And I went into that meeting armed with a laundry list of, of software research I had done and very technical. I, I had a spreadsheet, it was all laid out. Um, and, and she 
provided lots of insights into how these nonprofits actually work and, and how they would or wouldn't be able to implement recommendations um, compared to how a corporation would. Um, and, and that insight was really valuable to me in, in learning and, and also provided, she provided some, some further research learning for me to do in, in the area of nonprofit consulting. Uh, no questions from my side. Thank you. But thank you for putting together the presentation. Really appreciate all your inputs. Thank you so much, team. Last but not least, we have our more team. Um, after this presentation, we'll have the judges in a breakout room to pick their top three and their ultimate winner. But more, you are up next. Thank you. Good evening. Introducing Medan Orphan Relief Effort or more as we're gonna to refer to it now, a grassroots all volunteer organization aimed at supporting the orphans in Ethiopia. Next slide, please. Today, we wanna to introduce this wonderful organization, talk about our role in aiding them with their social media and fundraising strategies and some future steps that they will be taking. Next slide. Methan, as an organization, raises awareness and funds to send back to Ethiopia where the Medin Social Center supports these children. Their three main pillars are education, health and nutrition, and community. Next slide. Uh, so the, for the vision of more in the future direction, uh, after talking with them for a few, uh, few interactions, uh, we determined that uh, with them, what their main uh, uh, main uh, points are uh, to go forward. Uh, first was increasing fundraising and grant capacity uh, to expand their activities. Second was expanding their social media presence. And third was to create a sustainable plan for a volunteer grassroots organization. Next slide, please. So uh, in preparation for a uh, in preparation for these two distinct tasks of social media and marketing and fundraising, we divided our team into six with uh, teams of three and three, depending on our strengths and our previous experience to better help uh, the client and the project go forward. Um, next slide, please. This is a sample template that we created for more. In terms of brand building, we worked with more to develop a six month timeline to strategically target the various social media platforms. We also developed templates for various kinds of posts to be shared on these platforms. Next slide. So uh, in terms of fundraising, we had to look at different opportunities. Um, and we looked at about 20,000 different opportunities and screened down based on different filters. So whether they can uh, use like US, uh, their US status or, um, or, uh, or like if they can operate in Ethiopia and like, you know, all these different grants and foundations have different um, criteria in order to qualify. So after screening these 20,000 opportunities, we found about 40 opportunities that, uh, that uh, more might be uh, eligible for. And in working with the client, we were able to see 15 to 20 that they should focus on. Our recommendation is to focus on six to 10 organizations and try to build, build a connection with them, maybe a warm introduction through LinkedIn or other sorts of uh, platforms such as email or even like a telephone call um, in order to um, get, in order to increase the visibility of their application and prepare for a letter of intent, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, needed uh, in order to qualify, uh, in order to go forward in the application process. Um, next slide, please. Our biggest challenge was understanding the role of more. It took us some time to understand the intricacies of their working and restrictions they had as an organization when working on social issues in Ethiopia. The biggest takeaway from this experience has been the importance of open and clear channels of communication. This made for a very comfortable work environment, making this experience even more valuable. Another major learning experience came from the time we spent understanding the intricacies of the organization. It may have taken us longer than expected, but it made our deliverables much more customized to their needs and avoided multiple iterations. Another big thing we learned was the importance of setting realistic timelines and not over-promising. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so in order for continuing the, uh, the work, we recommended and gave them different avenues to leverage the student body and maybe underclassmen interns in order to uh, continue and implement the work and recommendations that we set forward, um, including the, uh, the posting timeline and uh, focusing on those six to eight um, or uh, foundations for letter of intents. Um, and uh, thank you for listening and um, happy to answer any questions about this wonderful experience. We had a very good time with the more and Thanks team, passing off to the judges. Cool, uh, one quick question. Um, so what were some of the major like criteria when shortlisting funders? So when you arrived at that kind of shortlist? So that for, uh, we wanted to see like the portfolio of projects that they uh, fund and the regions that they fund. So there might be uh, some keywords such as like Africa or international development or cho uh, uh, children welfare, but if, the, if the foundation doesn't kind of work in that um, area, then uh, Ethi uh, in Ethiopia may, may work in other countries, they may not be interested. So then we also screen for, do they have current, uh, uh, current uh, grants that they give out to work done in Ethiopia as well? And also we looked at the, the um, uh, funding amount. So uh, MOA has an annual budget and they had kind of an expectation of what type of grants they are. We didn't they were not really keen on applying for very small grants, like one to 2000. So we kind of focus on mid-sized to larger grants to kind of um, go forward because they are in the process of capacity building for their, um, for their initiatives. So we also looked at like the number of grants, the, the grants size, as well as the type of work that they did in the regions that they service. So thank you to the team for being the last team and waiting so patiently to uh, present. That was wonderful. And I would just uh, make more of a comment. I love the fact that you saw the value in building a relationship with the client so you could then customize the recommendations to their needs because you had more of an intimate relationship with them through that understanding. Uh, right, that was like a, that was like a very uh, a good point that you brought up. We had like a, a very wonderful relationship and we both felt that we mutually learned a lot. Um, me coming from like a uh, STEM, uh, st a graduate STEM background, um, it was great to work with the team uh, with diverse perspectives and also to work with um, a family of individuals um, that really wanted to push forward for the welfare of these children in Ethiopia. So I'm um, very thankful to be able to work in this kind of work with them and um, build their capacity to help even more children and be temporarily part of the family, I guess, for um, our duration with more. Thank you. Well, thank you, team, for sharing these details. Sounds like a very interesting and wonderful project that you were part of. Uh, could you just uh, share with us how big was the team at MORE and how do they intend to take forward some of the recommendations that you've put together uh, as part of the project work? Uh, so um, more is mostly grassroots and volunteer, I believe of 20 to 30 individuals. We interacted with a majority of them and uh, we gave them sort of like strategy documents to um, guide them for implementation work. And then we also uh, are also in the process of helping them get more permanent interns that can work for an extended period of time dedicated towards fundraising or social media. Um, because there might be some things they can learn from, you know, uh, having these types of uh, interns, um, and it could be a very mutual and benefit process to kind of oversee the work that we kind of recommended, so that this work can be continued um, going forward. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, team. All right, so Soda will put us into or put the judges in a breakout room with herself. Um, over the next few minutes, they're going to be deciding. Um, while they decide, we're going to have a little bit of a feedback session between us and the participants. Um, but we're going to pause the recording for now until the finals begin. All right. Um, before the judges announce their winners, just a couple quick personal plugs for the Center for Social Value Creation. Uh, we have another iteration of our Impact Consulting Fellowship. 
Soto will be reaching back out for the fall with a new batch of clients, maybe some recurring, maybe some new ones. We're scoping that out over the next two months approximately, uh, but just being ready for our next run at ICF. Um, if you're interested in a more research focus, we have our Research Impact Fellowships Grand Challenges Symposium this uh, Monday night at 5 p.m. where tw uh, 13 different students are gonna present on 10 research projects. Um, and then our big thing that is coming up this fall is our first ever Global Goals Jam. For those of you who might not have heard of it, the Global Goals Jam is a design thinking competition where 86 different cities across the world at the same time are gonna be tackling challenges in their own communities. This year for us, it's gonna be September 17th to the 19th. So that Friday through Sunday, um, over the course of those three days, you'll be presented with a problem have, with a team of four other students, kind of like Impact Consulting Fellowship, but only have a 48 hour window to present a solution to this challenge. At the end of it, we're gonna have a lot of different individuals, including potentially local politicians who are going to be able to make actions on your decisions, um, have that input and that feedback. And then um, throughout the process, you're gonna get design thinking coaching from our Academy of Innovation Entrepreneurship. A lot more to come on that, but just so you have a save the date for the dates, that's from set Friday, September 17th, that afternoon, until Sunday, September 19th, where the presentations will be that afternoon as well. Uh, that being said, I'll pass it back to the judges. Not sure how you guys are gonna go for this, but take it away. Cool. So um, first off, I want to say that we were all very impressed with uh, with everyone's presentations. Um, you know, a lot of innovative organizations, a lot of strong recommendations, a lot of great reflections and learnings and so forth. And just kind of saw that consulting demeanor coming out with with everyone, really, uh, which is a very soft but uh, important skill uh, in management consulting. Um, there were three organizations that we uh, highlighted. Uh, uh, the number three organization uh, we looked at was uh, Headsets versus Cars. Um, you know, we were impressed with the, the strong research uh, that was undertaken, the understanding of the problem, uh, the conviction in the work, and how that kind of showed throughout the storytelling process and so forth. Um, you know, the solutions were, uh, again, based on the, the root causes of problems and uh, very market-oriented in nature. And yes, so uh, headsets versus cars as uh, number three. Congrats to the team. Number two, uh, we looked at as a mother's promise. Um, you know, there seems to be like there was a lot of learnings across everyone, that personal growth uh, that everyone kind of uh, experienced throughout this last uh, eight, 10 weeks uh, was very high, um, very professionally done, very cohesive team. Uh, and so forth. Um, you know, it uh, laid out the kind of action plan very well across various different streams and really kind of integrated everything at the end. Um, so Mother's Promise, number two, congrats to the team. The uh, number one team uh, was actually unanimous. Uh, all the judges uh, actually marked them as number one. Uh, and this is Green Logic. So Green Logic, uh, we we're just all really impressed with, uh, um, you know, the major pivot, uh, you know, and kind of uh, advisory uh, to the client, um, you know, kind of really kind of uh, a very different kind of uh, scope or kind of uh, <clears throat> than what was originally envisaged and a major, major pivot to the actual whole entire business model, um, you know, which I'm sure had to like, you know, manage the client very well and so forth. And you did offer you know, both recommendations and solutions, that kind of original one, but this kind of major pivot and so forth. Um, also felt that it was very market slash regulatory in, uh, oriented. You know, policies are shifting in the, in the direction, um, already connected to the industry, you know, so really leveraged a lot of the kind of uh, internal strengths plus external kind of trends as well. Um, and yeah, we are all just very impressed with the, uh, with the full team kind of speaking about their experiences, the growth, uh, you know, um, and everything involved there. So once again, congrats to, to everyone really, uh, and uh, these top three teams as well. 
Sounds if uh, Roy or Donna want to add anything, welcome to you. And I just wanted to add and say that uh, I think a lot of the teams had the opportunity and the potential to work on great projects as part of uh, this whole program. Uh, so congratulations to the team on getting these opportunities across uh, to students at a time, especially when the virtual work world makes it uh, difficult in so many ways to experience what the real world is about. Uh, so uh, kudos to everyone for putting together what they did. And uh, first step in one of the many learnings that will come your way as you traverse the real world scenarios. So congratulations to all the winners and congratulations to everyone uh, for gaining so much through their, uh, through their internship process. Yeah, I would just echo those uh, thoughts. You know, it's hard work and especially sometimes uh, understanding and navigating with clients, real clients. That's great real world experience. And it's very relevant for any field that you're gonna go into. Um, there's always gonna be those types of challenges. You're always gonna have to pivot. You're going to be in ambiguous situations and you know one word of advice i would say is you know always be honest with your clients um not choosing their idea or their solution that they really wanted is really hard to do and i think green logic did so um i had a, a friend of mine who worked with booz allen hamilton and and did just that and he thought he was going to get fired that day because the client stormed out of the room but later on that uh, client hired him away from booz county and uh, that was the, one of the reasons why so you know, each of you did a great job and hard work, and we really appreciate everybody just really investing in this and, and what great learning outcomes. Really proud of each one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you again for all of you, the over 10,000 hours that we put in as a team. Thank you so much to the faculty and alumni sessions they led, the alumni coaches, and thank you to our judges and especially Soda for these last few months of work. I appreciate all of you for making this possible. One more shout out to Tata for being a member of our Coalition for Better Business. I really appreciate this. And like we said before, we have our Research Impact Fellowship coming up next week in its Grand Challenges Symposium, our Global Goals Jam coming up in September, and we're wrapping up um, with another uh, iteration of ICF in the fall with more great events to come. So have a great evening and We'll talk to you soon.